You're listening to Pieces of Eight, a new Doctor Who podcast totally dedicated to the many and varied adventures of the eighth incarnation of that dashing Time Lord. Each week we'll be casting our eyes, and in many cases ears, over all kinds of adventures featuring Paul McGann's Doctor. My name's Rebecca Chapman. And I'm Kenny Smith. We're going to be talking all things McGann, whether it's his fleeting appearances on our screens, or his adventures in books, novellas, full cast audios, short stories, comics, animations, talking books, or anything else. So, Becca, for the benefit of our listeners, why don't you tell them a wee bit about yourself as a Doctor Who fan and how you first discovered our favourite Time Lord? Oh, how I first discovered the... Oh. <laughs> That's a long time ago now, actually. I first discovered him second-handly, actually, back in the days of Tumblr. I had a Doctor Who fandom blog. It was called Pond in the Pandora, <laughs> which was topical at the time, obviously. And I had a friend who was in America, and she was obsessed with Big Finish and Paul McGann, and kept telling me that Paul McGann was the best Doctor, and how much she loved him and all the rest of it. And kept sending me, like, audio snippets of him. I was like, you know, he sounds really good, but I never got round to actually listening to anything of his, unfortunately. And then, gosh, last year, a couple of years ago, I think it was that I finally went, do you know what, I'm going to give this a go and started listening to him. And yeah, he's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. What about you? When did you first discover the uh, Doctor? I'm, uh, as you know, I'm a little bit older than you. I, mean, I was born in 1974. Better tell everybody what year you were born in, Becca. <laughs> 1995. And there we go. So Becca was just over a year old when the TV movie went out. There we go. I first discovered Doctor Who in 1978 when I used to watch it with my mum. And my first memory is of one of Tom Baker's stories, The Invasion of Time, when the Doctor is collecting a new canine from his cupboard, having built Mark II and I carried on watching over the years and carried on with the series when it ended in 1989 and then kept reading the New Adventures books as they came out in the 90s. And then in January 1996, it was all over the papers, Doctor Who's coming back in a movie with Paul McGann and Sylvester McCoy as well. And because I'm such a sad person, I was working in a newspaper at the time and I contacted the BBC press office and bear in mind, this is pre-email days, I got them to fax me the press release <laughs> confirming that Paul McGann was the Doctor. And Brilliant. Yeah, and then it, Grace Holloway was originally called Grace Kelly. So there we go, there's a little bit of trivia that's not appeared in many places, because I do love my trivia. The and trivia is always good. <laughs> so I followed the production of it, and I went to a convention in Manchester that Easter when the executive producer, Philip David Segal, was in attendance, a British guy, and he teased the audience with it, played a bit of the theme tune and showed a few photos, but no clips whatsoever. And everybody was so hyped up and ready for it. And the film going out on TV, I queued up to buy it at midnight at HMD. I think it was the 22nd of May, 1996. And then went to, the, went to the pub in Edinburgh to watch it with the Doctor Who group on Monday, the 27th of Aww. May that year. So I've been there for the eighth Doctor throughout. And I then carried on buying the BBC books when they came out. I do have the full set, buying Doctor Who magazine, which had the comic strips. Radio Times had its comic strips. And then, of course, along came Big Finish, which brought back Paul McGann himself. Woohoo! <laughs> so, yes, I do have a, a very long standing relationship with this incarnation of the Doctor, especially as I do quite a lot of stuff about him for Big Finish. Yes, yes. I, I kind of feel like. I almost feel like a baby fan. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you're a baby fan or a grown-up fan. It means you're, you're a fan and that's all that matters. That's something that really bugs me. So many people are sort of like, well, you can't be a real fan unless you've watched every single episode and you've heard all the missing episode soundtracks and then you've done this and you've got to read all the book. And no, it doesn't matter. If you like Doctor Who, that's all that matters. You're a fan. End of. So never, ever, ever, <laughs> never, ever feel that you're a baby fan. Far from it. <laughs> So, given that this month is the 25th anniversary of the TV movie's original VHS release, VHS Kids, and TV broadcast, 
Becca, what were you doing back in May 1996, now that we've established how young you are? <laughs> um, I mean, gosh, I would have been <laughs> 15 months old, so probably just starting to pull myself up on the edge of the sofa, <laughs> maybe walking a bit, you know? <laughs> what about you? <laughs> well, I was working at the East Kilbride News, which is a local newspaper in Scotland, and doing James Bond fanzines around that time. So yes, I was uh, quite, uh, always, always enjoyed my writing stuff because that's my day job and some people might know my work in Vortex for Big Finish and Big Finish Companion. So I do get to speak with a lot of people who are shaping the Eighth Doctor's journey. But let's talk about the TV movie itself because this is something that I know that you've only recently watched for the first time in the last few months. <laughs> yes. So I didn't actually know that the movie existed <laughs> until last year. Uh, and then we decided that we were going to have a watch along. And, and yeah, it was great. <laughs> yeah. You're familiar, of course, with the likes of Eccleston, Tennant, Matt Smith, Capaldi. And how did you find this, this Doctor? Because he's a bit of a hybrid between a slightly more long-winded, speechy incarnation from the classic series. But he's also got some of the zippier dialogue that we're used to today. Yes, I felt like he was a... Obviously, I've watched some of the classic Who episodes previously, and I definitely felt like he was almost a bridge between the two and that it felt very almost welcome to the new generation, as it were. What did you think about the TARDIS console room? Because at the time, for fans like myself, we were used to just a small white control room, and all of a sudden we've got this massive expanse with the library and the chairs? Yeah. Yes, yes, I loved that. I thought that that was very, very apt. You know, I almost, I, I could imagine the Doctor quite happily kind of floating through space with a book for an afternoon because he's not doing anything. And I liked it. I thought it was a great aesthetic choice. <laughs> it gives him the feel of, with that costume, obviously it's, a, it's an American cowboy or lawman outfit or supposed to be Wild Bill Hickok, but it does give him the sort of the look of a, a dashing Edwardian adventurer as well. Yes, yes. And I really, oh yeah, I do really like it. The the outfit, the, the console, the big armchairs. I would like to live in that TARDIS, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I've always said, if I win the lottery, I'm having a replica of that built in my custom built house. I can definitely get behind that. <laughs> Excellent. Well, you can come round and read all my Eighth Doctor books and have a seat in my library. Just make sure you don't I'd like crack that. open the cask that's got the master inside it. <laughs> I'll do my best. Because <laughs> for me, the first time I saw this, it was so different to what we've been used to. The direction of it is far pacier. It's very zippy. It moves along at a hell of a pace. Yes, there's a huge American influence on it, which you would expect, given that it was made for the Fox Network and by the BBC when it was shown as a TV movie. But it definitely is, it's like say, it's that bridge between the classic and the new. There's so many touches of what's come in the new series in there. The Doctor's far more laid back. His dialogue is just so, just so chilled at times. And he's just, he's such a gripping incarnation. Paul McGann, you do want to watch more of him, don't you? Yes, I give an arm or so to be able to see Paul McGann as the Doctor on TV. He's fantastic. Yeah, he's got a youthful energy about him. And even now, obviously in audio, we're used to him and he's, the fact that I think he's just turned 60, but he's still got that youthful energy to him, which is quite incredible. Apparently he's 61. Whoa, I've lost a year. Oh yeah, you it's have. COVID. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> but for me, there's something new and fresh about him that just gives a whole shot in the arm to it because you've got that final shot with the Doctor in the TARDIS drinking his cup of tea and off he goes and you just think, I want to know where you go next. Yes, yes. It feels like such a cliffhanger and I would have loved more and it's such a shame. What did you think about Chang Li and Grace? As I mean, they were potential companions just waiting to happen, weren't they? Oh, they were. I mean, I really liked Grace. I know there's a few people who didn't like her and found her too American. But I really liked her. I thought she was, you know, she was fun. She did the whole companion thing really well. She asked the right questions. She was the right amount of, of an info dump, as it were. And yeah, I thought she was fantastic. 
it had very much a rose vibe as it, yeah. as it went on, I felt. Yeah, I think there's some great bits in there. Daphne Ashbrook's comedy timing is brilliant because you've got that bit where the doctor's going, these shoes, they fit perfectly. And then he just dashes off and she's just standing there pulling her face going, what? Like something at Scooby-Doo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Chang Lee, I think, is interesting as well because here we've got somebody from, uh, and again at this point in time, Doctor Who's only companions had been white. So here we've got an Asian actor fulfilling a companion role and the fact that he's come from a gang background as well and he's it just shows the doctor in your life can help redeem you and help you out of it just like happened with rose the doctor makes you a better person yeah yeah of course you know there's he's he's done that quite a few times through his incarnations he's a good man and he's, he's a good man to have around i think i think also we've got to talk about the master here because you're more used to the likes of our john sim or indeed Missy and Derek Jacobi. So what did yes. you think of this slightly mad, over the top, I always dreads for the occasion master? I kind of found him a bit like a pantomime villain. I'm always a fan of a pantomime villain, you know, you love to hate them. Oh, they're great, you know, he's very over the top, very colorful, very pantomime villain. But I think also he's got, when you've got the fact he snaps his wife's neck, when the master first possesses the body, but he's got a really ruthless hard edge that perhaps other masters are slightly more fluffy about. That is true. I mean, we don't really see any of the masters in, you don't really see any of them kind of take control of the situation in, in such a manner. Yeah, I mean, apart from John Sims trying to kill lots of people, I, I can't think of any where they've gone out of their way to cause pain so instantaneously. Yeah, and ruthlessly. It's quite an nice gimmick as well, in the fact you've got the Masters being exterminated and then all of a sudden, lo and behold, he's become sort of a snake, morphant, and possesses a human body, Just and he'll do anything to survive. Yes, very parasitic. Yes, good word. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the thing that I was particularly gripped with at the end is when the Doctor's been imprisoned and he's got those horrible things keeping his eyes open. And I think that's absolutely horrible. It's very clockwork orange. And it does, it's, again, it's something you wouldn't have got in the classic era. And I don't know if you'd even have got that in the TV series now. It's almost a bit too scary and would give the kids nightmares. I mean, Clockwork Orange still gives me nightmares. So, yeah, I, I don't think that you'd get that now. It was very, ah. But I liked it. I, I thought it was a great addition to almost a, a growing up of the Doctor from this kind of, I, obviously he wasn't young, his incarnations previously, it definitely felt like it was a growing up step in him and helped him become everyone that he became since. And of course, the thing that it does that was really controversial at the time is, and it's something that happens all the time these days, is the Doctor gets to kiss. Yes, I'm, I'm never a fan of that. <laughs> <laughs> what, kissing in general I... or kissing the Doctor? No, the, the whole Doctor kissing thing, I feel like that's... Uh... It's unnecessary and a bit pandery, and I know that that's bad, but yeah, I'm not a fan. I definitely feel like it's... Ooh. For me, the first one I think is absolutely fine because he's got his memory back and he's like, yes, it's me, I've got my memory back, yes. And he kisses the first person who's there. But I think the second one, when Grace says, no, do it again, that um, maybe not quite. Exactly, you know, if we were going to kiss anyone, we'd have Tennant and Rose kiss. Well, no. <laughs> Yeah. It just felt like it felt like an American happy ending almost. Uh, the other controversial thing with fans at the time was the Doctor. I'm half human on my mother's side. It doesn't really matter, does it? No. Why should it? I mean, that's never been addressed ever since that I'm aware of. No. Nope. No. I think Russell T. Davis did have it worked out that he was going to have an alliance saying, "I was half human for one night." I don't quite know how he was going to how he just rationalised that, but it made me laugh. But sadly, that reason was cut. Yeah, it feels a bit dirty. <laughs> it does. It does. Mm, makes the mind boggle. But yes, all in all, I really like the TV movie and the fact it gave us a new Doctor. We've got the fact that he's excitable. He's hyperactive. He likes to say some words five times. Yes, 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 <laughs> or whatever, and just things like that. And it gave us a whole new canvas ready to paint upon. Sadly, we never got it for TV, but it's all there for books, TVs, comics, 
and audios. It is indeed, and I cannot wait to talk over them with you. Exactly. I think next time, maybe we'll head into the world of comics and look at the Titan miniseries. Oh, that, that would be good. I read those last night, actually. Well, there we go. That's a good bit of timing. Fantastic I'll, timing. I'll have to dig out my own copy of it. Yeah, because we don't want to have a critical timing malfunction, as the Doctor's TARDIS says on the screen. So. <laughs> well, thanks again for listening to our first Pieces of Eighth. We'll hopefully be joined in coming episodes by some guests who know a thing or two about the Eighth Doctor as well. And we look forward to it. We do indeed. I'm really excited. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks, Becca, for your time. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.